Presbyterian this morning, and it is um, on the situation of transgender persons who migrate to the United States. Um, this is hearing number 15. Um, we are sons, the civil society requesters of this hearing. We don't quite know what has happened um, to them. And because of that, I've asked um, the uh, um, executive, um, vice executive secretary to read the background of the information sheet which was given to us, otherwise we're starting empty. And then I would invite the state um, to make a response to that um, in 15 minutes. Um, and then thereafter, uh, we, um, commissioners and the executive secretary can um, put questions or make comments for another eight minutes. We're doing eight minutes. And because we know we have another hearing following this one. Um, so that being said, I now invite um, Ms. Mrs. Blanchard to read the background for us and, and the purpose of the hearing. President, um, so we're gathered here to hear about the situation of transgender persons who migrate to the United States. The purpose of the hearing is to open up a dialogue for the stakeholders to be able to come up with strategies to redress the situation of vulnerability and consequent violation of human rights of transgender person migrating to the United States. According to the petitioning organizations, transgender persons in Latin America and the Caribbean face discrimination and violence in their countries of origin, and this forces them to look for places where they can carry on their livelihood and live free from stigma and discrimination. As the petitioner stated, many of them therefore migrate to the USA in, re in search of international protection by way of asylum and refugee status. However, in their mobility process, transgender women are harassed by gangs, get absorbed by trafficking networks in transit countries such as Mexico, and suffer institutional violence. The petitioning organizations state that people who make it to the US after overcoming these challenges can find support from specialized organizations such as Casa Ruby, which helps and supports transgender persons who make it across the southern border. Generally speaking, however, transgender persons face a series of persistent violations of their human rights in the USA, including lack of access to identity documents, health services, antiretroviral tr treatment, and exclusion from the labor market, which leave them especially vulnerable. These situations get even worse for transgender persons who fail to get refugee or asylum status. We are rather surprised at this. Um, could you state what organization you're from? My name is Consuela Lopez and I'm re representing Casa Ruby. Yo soy Rachel Erazo y represento a la asociación Alfil Red Lac Trans. Um, having we having read the background, uh, because you were not here at the right time, we were waiting. We were waiting for someone to call us up. No, you have to come up. You requested the hearing. I'm sorry. We we, we don't have that human resource. Sorry. Yes. Um, anyway, I'll give you five minutes okay. to make your presentations. Please try to keep on time. To it. Buenas tardes. Yo soy Consuela López de Casa Rubí Centro Comunitario LGBTIQ y voy a presentarles datos recabadas en diferentes medios, publicaciones de investigación. 
Dado que no existen agencias del Estado que realizan este tipo de investigaciones o registro y sistematización de los casos de vulneración y violación de los derechos humanos de las personas trans, así como de los asesinatos de las personas transmigrantes que residen en los Estados Unidos, resulta poco escalable generar datos duros o concretos de la información con la que contamos. De la información recopilada, detectamos que al menos de 26 personas trans fueron asesinadas durante el 2019. Aunque siguen en la información compartida por el Grupo de Diversidad Sin Fronteras, Cuenta de la, durante el 2018, entre 150 y 180 personas trans han sido asesinadas. Los resultados de esta y otras investigaciones suelen ser complejas, de, en tanto no existen censos y estéticas oficiales que nos permiten tener una herramienta que genere conciencia sobre la realidad de las personas transmigrantes o que abandonan sus lugares de origen para buscar una mejor vida. No se logra abarcar todo el país porque lo consideramos que podrían existir otros cientos de casos no documentados. La falta de claridad en la casa de las muertas de las personas transmigrantes constituye además un factor agravante en la violación de sistemática a los derechos humanos de las personas trans en Estados Unidos, donde muchas veces no identifican de acuerdo a su identidad de género. La migración es un derecho y como el TAR merece que respeten los todos países destino, según el Centro Nacional por la Igualdad Trans en CTE por sus siglas en inglés. Hay aproximadamente 300.000 adultos indocumentados que se identifican de LGBT en Estados Unidos y según esta tíquida, la población trans se cree una fracción de esta población y se identifica como personas trans o género con, no conforme, alcanzando las 5.000 personas. Se cree que hay, hay 25.000 parejas de personas trans sin documentas, muchas ciudadanas estadounidenses y además que existen 30.000 niños y niñas de personas trans sin documentos con ciudadana, ciudadanía estadounidense. El sistema inmigratorio actual esté roto y lleno de prejuicios presentes contra las personas trans con lo que hace pestas se encuentran con altos niveles y inseguridad de empleo, pobreza y residuo de salud y inicuidad. Ser una persona trans emigrante significa que, ser, que se tiene un estado doble como minoría, creando barreras que impiden en el acceso de los derechos humanos elementales y las expone a mayor riesgo de violencia y discriminación. Estas diversas áreas de conflicto y discriminación impiden la plena participación en la sociedad de las personas transmigrantes y les creen más obstáculos para alcanzar el estado legal. Inseguridad de empleo. El primer problema es el desfalso dual de ser transmigrante indocumentada, lo que, lo, que, lo que dificulta encontrar trabajo que la subsiste. Y cuando, uno, y cuando aparece un empleo, existen grandes riesgos de explotas por los patrones. En muchos casos, las personas trans indocumentadas recurren a la participación en económicas y trabajos informales. Aproximadamente el 7% de las personas trans con estado legal manifiesta haber sufrido discriminación y violencia institucional. Esta situación se triplica en las personas trans indocumentadas, indocumentadas, I'm sorry, indocumentadas quienes además no están protegidas para la ley contra la discriminación. Y cuando no sufren discriminación, las personas transmigrantes sufren agresión sexual en sus trabajos por sus patrones, ingreso y viviendas inestables. La inestabilidad de ingreso también es un problema que afecta significativamente la vida de las personas migrantes trans que ya no son des desproporcionadas, más bajos que el del resto de la población. En la mayoría de los casos hablamos de los menos de 10 mil dólares al año, una tasa de progresa extrema, lo que genera directamente problemas de vivienda en la población transmigrante que se reside en Estados Unidos. La, la indigencia trans es resultado de la discriminación de la violencia contra la gente trans y la falta de marcos legales que protejan los derechos humanos de estas. Se entiende que los menos del 30% de las personas trans han sido 
desolajadas de lo menos de ver por prejuiciosos. Y entre las personas trans incomunicadas encontramos relatos de violencia física o abuso sexual cuando buscarán ayuda en refugio. Falta de acceso al... Sorry. Excuse me. Would you need extra time? And if so, how much? Because I have literally two minutes. Okay. Thank you. Um, falta de acceso al cuidar salud. En una constante de la mayoría de los países de la re, de región que las personas trans no tengan acceso al derecho humano a la salud factible y de calidad esa historia y de violencia institucional. También se repito en los Estados Unidos donde 50, 59% de las personas trans migrantes adultas no cuentan con seguro médico y aproximadamente 40% de las personas trans migrantes y indocumentadas tampoco cuentan en este tipo de cobertura. La fórmula compuesta por la falta de seguro y el miedo de discriminación en la violencia. El miedo de ser denunciados ante migración genera que muchas personas trans inmigrantes y indocumentadas se encuentran sin la adecuada atención médica. Esta disparar la cobertura cubría en la discualia de la psíquica y mental de las personas trans que residen en los Estados Unidos. Además, asegurar de las personas trans inmigrantes tienen acceso a los servicios de salud imprevisible para aumentar de la atención del VIH. Reduce la transmisión y luchar contra la el epidemia de un país donde prevalecen tres veces mayor las personas trans que en el promedio nacional. Solicitamos la creación de acciones concretas de ortuga de la de ciudadanía de las personas transmigrantes. Esto es el crucial para, para mejorar el bienestar económico y físico. La seguridad además no permita trabajar llegamente y ganar salarios más altos que impactarán las economía local y a través de la mejor del consumo, así como el ingreso de través del impuesto de los gobiernos locales, estales y federales. Este camino por la ciudadanía debe ser realista, alcanzable y ejecutable dentro de unos periodos de, de tiempo razonable. Y ya que las personas trans, migrantes, negras y latinas, resulta difícil cumplir con estas condiciones actuales, no co tener con un trabajo y demostrar cierto nivel de ingresos e económicos. Es importante además contemplar y patrocinar familia. Por todo lo de anteriormente expuesto, queremos recomendar repuesta, repuesta cemento a los Estados Unidos a trabajar en conjunto con la sociedad civil para discriminar la violencia hacia para las personas transmigrantes. La violencia que reciben las mujeres trans negras y las mujeres trans latinas es el causa del discurso del odio y xenofobia del bajo del desde el gobierno. Reducir la violencia institucional que nos están matando, proteger las infancias, adolescentes trans que están en los Unidos y que contribuir con talento y educación de la sociedad estadounidense. Solicitamos que las personas transmigrantes en los Estados Unidos se permita aprovechar su derecho a solicitar asilo para evitar que vuelvan al país donde sufren persecución y son víctimas de más violencia. A las personas transmigrantes privadas de su libertad se las abusa, maltrata y confinan solitariamente a raíz de su indicador en género. Existimos judicia, se debe proteger la privacidad de las personas trabajadoras y los sistemas de verificación para asegurar que estos temas no se conviertan en discriminación y violencia de personas trans. Finalmente, y yo, y en memoria de nuestras compañeras muertas, queremos pedirle a la Comisión que nos ayude a dar seguimiento a todos casos para que ninguna tenga que sufrir lo que gran mayoría de nosotros hemos sufrido. Queremos recordarles que somos personas sujetas de derecho y que deben de, que deben de ser garantizados. Nuestras vidas valen. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Um, I now invite the United States representatives to make their presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Distinguished commissioners, civil society colleagues at the other table, and secretariat colleagues. I am Andrew Stevenson, political officer in the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States in Washington, and I'm joined by Robin Meyer, our deputy chief of mission here at the U.S. Embassy in Quito, Rafael Diaz, human rights officer here at the U.S. Embassy, as well as Thomas Weatherthal of the U.S. Department of State's Office of the Legal Advisor. We're happy to represent our delegation this morning. I'd first like to extend the thanks to the United States government, to the government of Ecuador, 
for hosting us and other OAS states that are attending this period of sessions. We commend Ecuador for its commitment to human rights, both at home and across the hemisphere. I will first take a few minutes to convey the serious concerns of my government about the Commission's decision to hold this hearing and the next one this morning. Just over a month ago, the Commission sent the United States notification of its decision to hold these hearings. This one on the situation of transgender persons who migrate to the United States, and the next one on gun violence and human rights. We understand that these hearings are intended to be hearings of a general nature, or thematic hearings, governed by Article 66 of the rules. Increasingly, in recent years, the Commission seems to have made its standard practice to insert itself into ongoing domestic political discussions through the mechanism of a thematic hearing. The subjects on which the Commission convenes thematic hearings are often complex, fast-changing, the subject of significant domestic litigation or congressional considerations, and of great political sensitivity. We understand that. This can make it very difficult for the United States to meaningfully engage with the Commission about them and reduces the value of the Commission's involvement. The Commission is well aware of our similar long-standing concerns about the practice of convening thematic hearings about matters in active litigation in our domestic system. As we have repeatedly told the Commission, we cannot discuss specific details on such matters while the outcome of litigation is pending. It was in part for this reason that we found our, ourselves unable to participate in a September 2019 hearing on similar issues. The number of thematic hearings has risen sharply in recent years and now dwarfs the number of petition-based hearings, even as the Commission's backlog of petitions continues to grow and undermine its effectiveness. Since 1996, the Commission has convened 100 hearings involving the United States. From 1996 through 2011, petition-based hearings represented 75% of all hearings, with the Commission holding 34 petition-based hearings in just 13 thematic hearings. By contrast, from 2012 to the present, the Commission has convened just 10 petition-based hearings, contrasted with 43 thematic hearings, meaning that thematic hearings have represented over 80% of all hearings in the past seven years. We understand the Commission's desire to provide its views on important issues of the day, but the disproportion between thematic and petition-based hearings feeds directly into a larger problem of increasing concern to the United States. The Commission has been expending an inordinate amount of its limited resources, involving itself in high-profile and sensitive ongoing domestic political discussions, instead of to taking decisive action to address the severe and growing backlog of individual petitions. As a strong supporter of the Commission, and by far the hemisphere's largest financial contributor, we are concerned that the Commission is operating outside of its mandate and not focusing its limited resources as it should. And now I'll pass the, uh, the floor over to Tom Weatherthal. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning. Uh, just a few additional points. Uh, the, the Commission's strength and credibility in the region depend on its ability to operate effectively and efficiently in a constrained budgetary environment. It must demonstrate to states, civil society, and individuals that it is an efficient and effective institution. The severe backlog of individual petitions and the long amount of time that elapses between the filing of a petition and the case's ultimate resolution significantly diminishes this perception. To be sure, dealing with individual petitions is difficult, requires examination of alleged abuses that occurred years ago, and occurs mostly out of public view. But as you, of course, appreciate, it is indispensable work on which many individuals across the hemisphere hang their hopes. In sharp contrast, the topics to be discussed at the hearings today are not the subject of a petition before the commission, nor do they lack full and transparent debate and consideration in all relevant democratic and judicial fora in the United States. We understand that you may disagree with the views we've just set forth. We respect your independence and will, of course. Listen to your point of view and to that of civil society. Nevertheless, it remains the position of my government that the Commission should not have convened hearings on these issues, especially absent a petition. Each time the Commission convenes yet another thematic hearing on a hotly contested political issue that is the subject of robust debate in democratic institutions or a matter in active litigation, 
the United States finds itself reevaluating the utility of participating in hearings. But with that in mind, promoting respect for universal human rights remains at the core of U.S. foreign policy. As Secretary of State Pompeo has said, human rights are universal and LGBTI persons are entitled to the same respect, freedoms, and protections as everyone else. Around the world, we make a concerted effort to prevent and address violations and abuses of human rights and undue restrictions on fundamental freedoms. That includes threats to human rights and fundamental freedoms faced by LGBTI persons. We are concerned by the violence and multiple forms of discrimination historically marginalized groups, including LGBTI persons, frequently face throughout the Americas. It is our policy to denounce human rights abuses wherever they occur around the globe, and our engagement with countries like Brazil, Honduras, Guatemala, and Ecuador includes efforts to ensure that historically marginalized groups are protected and respected. Through our ongoing diplomatic and programmatic efforts, we are working to promote social inclusion and protect human rights while advancing inclusive security and growth in the region. We do this in part through initiatives that engage vulnerable groups and improve access to justice, services, and economic opportunities. Our embassies regularly raise LGBTI human rights with host governments, meet with LGBTI activists and relevant stakeholders, participate in pride parades, and observe the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia, Pride Month, Transgender Day of Remembrance, and Intersex Awareness Days, among others, and that includes in the OAS Permanent Council. In July, in just two examples, U.S. Embassy to Gusagalpa organized a diplomatic reception in observance of Pride Month, and the ambassador to Guatemala participated in an interview with local media to highlight U.S. commitment to human rights for all, including LGBTI persons. The Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs is the only regional bureau with the State Department with a race, ethnicity, and social inclusion unit, and the U.S. mission to the OAS continues to actively support the Commission's work on LGBTI issues, and is a proud member of the OAS LGBTI core group, and has engaged in numerous activities with you and with other organizations in Washington, including, in the past, Casa Ruby and Human Rights Campaign. Tom? Thank you, Andrew. Turning to the issue of migration, uh, the United States takes seriously its non refoulement obligations under the 1967 protocol relating to the status of refugees and the Convention Against Torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, the CAT. We encourage all individuals who have suffered or fear persecution in their home countries to seek assistance through the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, where possible in the first instance. For those who qualify, there are avenues for assistance, local solutions, and resettlement to third countries that avoid the risk and dangers of illegal immigration. That said, consistent with U.S. obligations under the Refugee Protocol and the CAT, U.S. law generally permits aliens physically present in the United States to apply for international protection in three different circumstances, which I can uh, elaborate on uh, yeah, maybe at the end of the presentation. Um, shall I go on? Yep. Let me apologize. I put up the wrong flag. Okay, so we do have more time. Okay, thank you. In that case, I will elaborate. Um, first, aliens who are in removal proceedings under Section 240 of the Immigration and Nationality Act, the INA, may apply for asylum, withholding of, of removal, and other relief and protection from removal before an immigration judge. These are so-called defensive applications. Second, an alien may raise a claim for asylum, withholding of removal, and other forms of relief and protection in expedited removal proceedings. Aliens arriving in the United States who are inadmissible to the United States because they are alleged to have engaged in fraud or misrepresentation. Uh, this is pursuant to Section 212A6C of the INA. Or they lack proper documents per Section 212A7 of the INA and certain other aliens as de designated by the Department of Homeland Security who have not been admitted or paroled into the United States are subject to expedited removal. When an immigration officer or agent encounters or apprehends an alien and determines that that alien is subject to expedited removal and that alien expresses a fear of persecution or torture, a fear of return to his or her country, or an intention to apply for asylum, the alien is referred to an asylum officer to conduct a credible fear interview. 
The purpose of the credible fear interview is to de determine if an alien has potentially meritorious protection claims for further consideration by an immigration judge while preventing individuals subject to removal from delaying removal by filing unmeritorious claims. If an asylum officer finds that an alien has established a credible fear of persecution or torture, the officer issues a notice to appear before the immigration court and the alien is placed into removal proceedings before an immigration judge under section 240 of the INA, where the alien is afforded the opportunity to apply for asylum or any other forms of relief or protection from removal from which the alien may be eligible. If the asylum officer finds that an alien has not established a credible fear of pers uh, persecution or torture, the alien may ask an immigration judge to review the asylum officer's negative credible fear determination. If the alien declines to seek review, or if the immigration judge concurs with the asylum officer's negative determination, then the alien may be removed from the United States under the expedited removal order. And third, and lastly, aliens physically present in the United States and not already in removal proceedings before the immigration court may apply for asylum with US Citizenship and Immigration Services, which is a so-called affirmative application. However, unaccompanied alien children who may not be placed into expedited removal also may apply for asylum initially with USCIS, even if they are in removal proceedings before an immigration judge. If USCIS does not grant the application, the application is referred to an immigration judge for a de novo review of the application. Andrew. Well, it's not possible for us to provide metrics on the specific number of transgender persons granted asylum or other forms of protection in the United States because protection data is not aggregated in this way at this time. Moreover, confidentiality regulations generally prevent us from commenting on specific cases uh, in which aliens, to include transgender persons, have sought or been granted asylum or another form of protection in the United States. However, we would like to note that the CBP and ICE uh, procedures recognize and include support for vulnerable populations, including... We should be more time because I gave them some time. We sure, yes. okay. Three Thank minutes. you. Okay, we're, we're almost done. And, and that includes support for, um, for members of the LGBTI community. Um, so in conclusion, please be assured that the United States is committed to promoting social inclusion and protecting the human rights of all persons, including LGBTI people. While we have made progress in the United States on these issues, we know that we are not yet where we need to be. We will continue to engage with civil society, the private sector, and our government counterparts in constructive dialogue to remove existing barriers so that all people can contribute and live up to their full potential. The United States condemns in all strongest forms and terms violence against transgender persons. The United States recognizes that it is incumbent upon all states to respect the human rights and fundamental freedoms of all persons within their territory and subject to their jurisdiction, including transgender persons. That concludes our presentation today and we look forward to your comments. No, 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 no. No. Morning. We now. <laughs> Thank you. It is now time for the commissioners and the uh, assistant um, executive secretary. She, uh, she will be intervening on the subject of our backlog, um, which was commented on by the United States. And um, in the meantime, I would invite my sister, commissioner, the rapporteur for. Uh, LGBTI, LGBTI persons' rights. rights to lead this segment. Thank you so much, Madam President. Uh, I'd start expressing my deep gratitude and recognition for the civil society represent representatives and also for the state representatives. Um, focusing on this, I would say, so important issue dealing with migrants who are trans persons or trans persons who are migrants. I think it's really important to give visibility and to give voice to the voiceless because they wouldn't be here. So um, I, I would uh, really highlight the importance of this public hearing. Um, 
I just like to highlight as well that as a um, special, as a, a rapporteur for LGBTI persons' rights, we adopted in 2015 a specific report about violence against LGBTI persons. And one of the conclusions of this report is that LGBTI community is not homo homogeneous. So trans persons are the ones who suffer more, who face a more severe and cruel pattern of violence and discrimination, especially women who are trans women, they suffer more. And I was shocked in my mandate to learn that the life expectancy of trans women in the region is 35 years. And the average of uh, concerning life expectancy of women, the average is 70 years. So they have half of, the, of a life because of a culture of oppression, of hostility, of discrimination, of violence. Um, I also would like to add that this year we adopt another uh, report about the recognition of LGBTI rights in the region, highlighting the best practice and the challenges as well. And we are just finalizing a, another report about trans persons and social, economic, and cultural rights, because we think this is an urgent matter. So um, having said that, I would raise two questions to the US representatives. The first question has to do um, is a question of clarification concerning the measures adopted to guarantee the right to receive asylum and the right not to return, the principle of no reformment. Um, if you have exactly the situation of migrants who are trans, uh, why? Because then you have a, an overlapping discrimination and this demands a reinforced duty, state duty to protect and to safeguard those rights. So um, in the commission, our mandate is guided by the language of rights and duties according to the corpus jury, inter-American corpus jury. So there is the right not to be discriminated against, there is the right not to, be, not to suffer violence because of gender identity and sexual um, orient, orientation. So I'd like to, um, to, to receive more information about the specific measures adopted by the state in order to provide uh, this level of protection that I would say should be reinforced because of the level of vulnerability of the victims who are trans plus migrants. And as we know, refugees and migrants, they suffer before, during, and after. All refugees, they, they reflect, all migrants, they reflect a pattern of human rights violations somewhere. And my second question has to do with the issue of inclusion. Uh, I, again, another um, raising here um, a question to clarify if the state representatives could clarify the specific measures adopted to protect trans persons, which I mean concerning law, legislation, public policies, uh, because according to your um, denounce, there is this lack of access to basic documents, lack of access to health, lack of access to, um, to labor, to jobs. So is the pattern that we have, the social, the deep social exclusion of trans persons, especially if they are migrants. They are excluded for, if you consider all the basic social system, they are excluded from all of them. So I'd like to know exactly what are the specific measures adopted that state. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I just want to very shortly deal with a point that um, the United States um, brought up in its um, responses. And that is I would read articles 61 and 62 of our rules of procedure 
in, um, and this is hearings before the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Article 61 reads, the commission may decide to hold hearings on its own initiative or at the request of an interested party. We had, I think, four requests for this hearing. 62, the purpose of hearings includes, and the first thing, receiving information of a general or particular nature relating to human rights situation in one or more of our member states. And basically, we do use these public hearings to gain information for our records and our use. And when we, we um, have hearings, we generally have hearings related of a regional nature of our own um, initiative. But in this instance, this was a hearing requested by civil society. I would now invite the, the uh, Vice Secretary to deal with the point that you brought up of our backlog so you can have up-to-date information on that point. Thank you. Gracias, Presidenta, y por la oportunidad también de, de hablar de las medidas que hemos adoptado para enfrentar el, el atraso procesal. Eh, siguiendo el primer objetivo del plan estratégico de la Comisión Interamericana 2017 a 2021, la Comisión estableció en su objetivo número uno el contribuir al desarrollo de una justicia interamericana más efectiva y accesible. Dentro de este objetivo, el primer programa, y teniendo en cuenta la centralidad del sistema de peticiones y casos y el gran atraso procesal que la Comisión ha acumulado desde los años 90, la Comisión estableció como prioridad la atención eh, del atraso procesal en todas sus etapas procesales. Desde 2017, entonces, la Comisión ha adoptado dos ciclos de medidas concretas que ha implementado en todas las etapas procesales y cuyos resultados ha ido reportando periódicamente la última vez por un comunicado de prensa publicado el 29 de octubre del 2019. Eh, como resumen, muy corto, eh, durante la etapa inicial la Comisión tenía un retraso de 8.295 peticiones pendientes de revisión inicial. Eh, se creó un grupo especial de atención para estudiar estas peticiones y hoy, a menos de un, un año de creado el grupo, se ha estudiado el 78% de las peticiones en etapa inicial y a, 2020, eh, a mediados de 2020 estaremos estudiando las peticiones que se reciban en ese mismo día. Entonces, eso ha sido un eh, avance realmente eh, importante en esta etapa de estudio inicial. En la etapa de admisibilidad, la Comisión ha adoptado... Eh, el doble y este año tres veces el número de informes que había adoptado en los años anteriores, lo mismo en la etapa de fondo y en la etapa de envío eh, de casos a la Corte Interamericana. Reitero que todos estos eh, resultados están detallados en el comunicado de prensa del 29 de octubre del 2019. Y en este periodo de sesiones, simplemente para... Eh, darle un punto de información, se han celebrado tres audiencias sobre eh, casos en etapa de fondo eh, ante la Comisión. Gracias, Presidenta. Um, thank you very much. I now will invite the parties to make their closing statement. We are very behind in time and we still have another hearing to attend to. So I invite civil society and you will have three minutes, because you can submit to us in writing, and the state would also have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I put down some, um, I just took some notes down that in the, like, as far as, sorry, legal migration. Um, how can trans women have legal migration if we have the lowest amount of work skills that we're able to uh, obtain visas? Um, even when someone obtains a visa and you come over to the states or different parts of the country, of different parts of the world, or the Mer North America, um, they deny us in entry, right? Because they, they, they won't even allow us to give us the visa. Um, so how are we going to do? How are we going to do a legal migration if we're not even up to par with what normal 
um, people, citizens of South and Central America are able to obtain a visa to be able to pass legally. Once we do obtain and get um, into North Amer into America illegally, they put us in detention centers that for sometimes they stay up for six months to a year, um, isolating us from different, from just being normal, correct? Um, some other things that I saw that it says, we, we, they, they don't give us any employment. Like when you said 31, 35%, I, my number was 31, 31 um, the average life expected span because 60% um, of my friends that I grew up with are no longer here just due to the lifestyle. And these are people that were in America, not just in their city from Central and South. Um, the other thing is that how are we able to provide information to people when we're, we can't even be identified. Does that make sense? Where they put us in different genres or different genders where you're either female or male and you're not identified as a individual source, correct? Whereas people can say, I am a transgender woman and I need different attention or different resources because if you put me in a prison with all males after I couldn't obtain a visa, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be a subject to either violence, harassment, um, rape, any kind of, in, in some cases, murder. Um, so I don't understand how that would work. Um, I, I was fortunate that I came to America with my family and I had political asylum, but not for being transgender, for being a, a, ref, a refugee of a war. But I was fortunate. But a lot of my trans sisters that have come over, that I've seen, um, come over illegally, it's, it, the fight isn't even over. It just starts as soon as they get into the jail cell. And, they, and, and if they're leaving their countries because people are killing, them, killing us and we're not getting employment, we're being dis, um, discriminated, how are we supposed to get out of jail or get out of detention centers and immediately have to become an honest taxpaying citizen with all these obstacles and hurdles that we have in order just to obtain a regular um, green card or anything just to be able to pay, be an honest taxpaying citizen. So we don't have any money from Central America. We, it's not like we save thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to, to pay for attorneys, to be able to provide housing for yourself, um, to not, because you can't work. So it's not like you, you can just go to a regular job and, and have a regular paycheck. So how are we supposed to survive? And that's why we are pushed into certain kind of um, lifestyles that are very detrimental to our long life of living because it's, it's a circle that continues to go around and round and round. Um, and I just want to say, please pay special attention to this case, these cases, because these are human people. These are human rights that people are, are, that deserve and we all deserve to be treated with human and respect. Thank you. Thank you very much. I invite the United States to make its response. Three minutes. Thank you very much, Madam President. I just want to begin by commenting or replying on the issue of the backlog, just to uh, confirm our ongoing support for the strategic plan of the Commission. We've been engaged with you for years in support of the various elements of the strategic plan, with a special focus on the backlog and special direction of our U.S. resources toward the backlog. That's why we, I think, are, are so focused on the issue. Um, and also the ongoing work um, in the Caribbean. So those are two areas of the strategic plan that we continue to especially um, focus and encourage you to, to, to emphasize. Um, and al although we, we do applaud the ongoing efforts to streamline the case management, we recognize you face an ongoing and monumental task in simply addressing the cases before you. So we recognize that the more hearings, the more sessions you have, uh, you're a victim of your own success in having more petitions come to you. So it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a successful problem to have, but it's something that I think merits um, a realistic response and mechanism for, for tracking on your part. Um, before turning uh, the floor over to Tom to talk a little bit about the asylum process and, and resources for LGBTI uh, migrants, I would just like to reconfirm our support for TDOR, Transgender Day of Remembrance in the Permanent Council, which we expect to support as part of the core group next week in Washington. Thank you, Andrew. Um, just a, a few uh, quick points on the, the question of special protections, um, particularly in the migration context for transgender persons. 
Um, ICE guidelines set out medical protocols for transgender four nationals that include providing them physical and mental evaluations within two days of entering an ICE facility, a medical treatment plan if necessary, and access to health services. With respect to particular treatments, such as hormone therapy, such treatment is provided to transgender detainees, de detainees pardon me, who are already receiving treatment when they are taken into custody. The guidelines also provide that transgender detainees shall receive other transgender-related health care and medication based on medical need. Um, for more information on these guidelines, I would direct you to the performance-based national detention standards, which ensures that detainees have access to appropriate and necessary medical, dental, and mental health care, including emergency services. And lastly, even upon initial encounter or apprehension, CBP provides care to at-risk individuals with special concern for their particular vulnerability, including transgender individuals. If there are any observed or reported indications of injury or need for medical treatment or appropriate medical care, it must be provided in a timely manner. And for additional information here, um, you're also directed to the National Standards on Transport, Escort, Detention, and Search, or TEDS. And uh, just to close, I'll reiterate the point that Andrew made earlier, that the United States recognizes that it is incumbent upon states to respect the human rights and fundamental freedoms of all persons within their territory and subject to their jurisdiction, including transgender persons. Thank you. Thank you very much to both sides, civil society and to the representatives of the United States. You've helped us to gain a little bit of time, but we're still behind. And I do um, move towards the close of um, this hearing with a great thanks to the state of Ecuador for hosting these period of sessions here. And we are eternally grateful for, for this kindness extended to us and to the, all those who had matters and will have matters this afternoon to be dealt with by the commission. We thank you both for being here, and we thank the audience for being here. With that said, we this hearing is at an end. <laughs>